All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, we're so glad that you're here. And for those of you that are joining, we just wanted to take a minute and introduce ourselves so that we can get started as close to one o'clock because we know time is precious. So my name is Tara O'Brien, and I am a Spark Partner and Facilitator. Um, prior to this role, I spent almost 20 years in education all across the US from San Francisco all the way out to Portsmouth, Rhode Island, with my last role being here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I've worked in the K-12 environment primarily and was a middle school principal throughout my um, administrative career as well. And I've worked in small schools, big schools, boarding schools, day schools. And so um, I have quite, a, quite an experience with different educational backgrounds. So I'm glad you're here. And uh, I look forward to sharing this information with you. Yeah, hi everyone. And for those who are just joining us, um, if you wouldn't mind popping in the chat box, your name, where you're joining us from, and maybe your school and your role. Um, so my name is Victoria Rodrigue. I am also a partner and facilitator with BTS Spark. Um, I was a high school principal for five years. I was and still am um, a WASC um, visiting committee chair. So I work with a lot of schools on the accreditation process. I've primarily worked in independent schools, but I started out um, my career working for an after school pro program in the public school district. So um, I have insight into both sides. I've also worked with um, a charter school organization. So I've worked with all different types of schools. And originally um, I was in academia. Um, so I was teaching at the college level. So definitely um, have seen education from all different angles. Um, I'm excited that all of you are joining us today that you've been able to take time out of your schedules to be with us. Um, so I am just going to go over quickly um, the ground rules um, for today. So if you'd just like to take a minute and read over this slide, um, make sure that you agree with these ground rules. Um, and just like to add that today's main session will be recorded. Um, we will only be sharing the recording with registrants. Um, so those of you who registered for this webinar, um, the breakout rooms will not be recorded um, and neither will the chat. So just keep that in mind. Um, if there are things you wanna share today, you're not comfortable seeing them, um, you don't want them to be recorded, you can also use the chat box. So I just wanted to make everyone aware of that. Um, and the other thing is um, there are going to be some times where we may ask you to reflect. So for that, you might wanna have a notebook, a piece of paper and a pen or pencil handy. So um, the other thing, just as a general check-in, um, we'd like to know, how are you feeling coming into this session today? Um, and what you hope to take from this webinar? And I've added one fun icebreaker question. You can respond to this if you want. What is one talent you have that no one at work knows about? So I see we have people from different states here all the way from Vermont on the other side of the country. Welcome, Chris. I'm also from the East Coast originally. <clears throat> all right, does anyone wanna pop into the chat how they're feeling or what you hope to take away from today's session or obviously the fun Icebreaker of one talent that you have that no one at work knows about. I certainly know I'm coming into this really um, excited that we're talking about burnout, that we're making this a conversation a sort of on the forefront, that we're not hiding behind it. And um, I hope you take away from this workshop what I'm hoping that we serve you in the best possible way that you feel that you've got a tool to help you when you're feeling. Um, perhaps stressed or overwhelmed or that you have some awareness and recognition of the factors that go in to burnout so that you can start being really proactive in your own life. Glad to hear that we have one person who is feeling good. Feeling like there'd be a huge shift. That's great to hear. Uh, feeling grateful. I agree with that, Sabrina. I'm also feeling pretty grateful right now. Despite, despite everything else, um, I think it is sometimes important to focus in on the things that, like our family, 
I was just thinking, I'm so glad that I have a supportive partner um, right now because I don't know how I would have survived the past few years. Cold and happy to work. Yes, those of us who are from the South or California are not so used to very, very cold weather. <laughs> so when it gets into the 40s and 50s, we get cold. Yeah, I agree, Alyssa. Um, all of the educators who are feeling burnt out, there, it is a worry um, what so many of us um, have been going through even prior to COVID and continue to go through. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Rick, for your super honest piece in there, feeling tired and done and very isolated in this process. Absolutely. I felt yeah. like that as a principal, sort of all by myself. Yeah. That's why I love doing things like this because I do feel isolated as well, working from home now. And, and it's such a strange time. Um, I agree with Regina. Sometimes I'm not sure how to feel, but I think coming together with other people is really helpful. Um, and that's something that I miss about being in a school environment. So um, let's see briefly. Oops. Yes. So let's just go over the objectives for today. And thank you everybody for sharing um, how you're feeling with us. Excited to see so many people from different parts of the country here. So our first objective for today is to understand what burnout is. So actually, what is burnout? What do we mean when we say burnout and what causes it? Second, we are going to explore the importance of emotions and understanding our emotions and how they relate to stress. And finally, um, we're going to leave you with a tool that you can use to manage your emotions and make conscious choices when you're triggered by a stressful event. So one of the worst feelings that I have when I'm stressed is feeling like I don't have control over anything and there are no good choices. So hopefully this tool will help you with that today. Oops. All right, so let's get into talking about um, what burnout is. And throughout the um, workshop, Victoria and I, like she said, have moments planned in here where Oops. we're gonna ask for your thoughts, either um, an opportunity to come off mic and um, share, share in the chat. So uh, if you're not yet muted, that would be great just since we can um, keep the background noise to a minimum. So what we'll do is I want to start with where you are. And I want you to take a moment here to think about what comes up for you when you hear the term burnout. So if you have, like, if you just like to think that's fine, if you have a journal or, a, you know, even just a, a quick notebook, what comes up when you hear the term burnout? What emotions might come up for you? Are there any physical sensations? Are there like scenarios or situations or, or environmental factors that come up? I'm just going to um, ask some, those of you who aren't, if you could mute yourself, because we're hearing some background noise. What comes up for you when you hear the term burnout? Motions, physical sensations, situations in your school, in your life. And with each of these exercises, you know, if we were in a coaching situation or had, you know, a whole half day, gosh, even days to talk about this, you'd want to stay in this space a little longer. But since we have just an hour together, um, let's go ahead and move in to looking at the 12 stages of burnout. And if you want to start sharing, sharing in the chat, some of the things that have come up for you when you were thinking about burnout? Like what are there emotions that come up for you? Is it stuff that you feel in your body? Um, what we have found is that there are 12 or not us, there are 12 stages of burnout. And this is research that's been done um, by Fernberger and Gail North. You can see the diagram on the screen. We also do have um, a PDF if you haven't yet downloaded it, that gives a little more description oh, at sorry. each one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going, I was actually going to share um, here. I will share this in the chat. And what I loved when I first read this document was that it gave some clear descriptions about what was happening. I certainly know when I was feeling at, at different points, like I didn't really get that there were these different phases and stages of burnout. I just knew that I was working really hard and I was tired a lot and things weren't always going the way I wanted. So as you look at these 12 stages, 
Do you notice that there's a connection between maybe what you wrote down around how you're feeling, how it's showing up in your body, situations at work, and any of the 12 stages that are on there? Do you start to see a connection? Victoria, what about you? Have you ever been in a situation where burnout's been front and center on your mind? Yeah. And it's interesting what you say about the 12 stages, because there definitely are stages to burnout. Um, so when I, when I was 30, I became principal of a small private high school in the Bay area. Um, and so this was my first experience taking on a major leadership role. And although our school was private, it served students regardless of their ability to pay. So we had a lot of issues around resources. We weren't very well funded. And my first week on the job, I learned that we didn't have a functioning printer. We had unreliable internet and Wi-Fi, classrooms that are filled with broken furniture, and there are no full-time support staff to help. The only full-time support is off on maternity leave. So the teachers are all wonderful, but most of them are part-time and I don't, and we pay them per class period. So the only person who's available to deal with all of this stuff is me. Um, and the board that hired me didn't really provide much guidance either because um, most of them retired actually my first year. And in five years, I never received an evaluation and I didn't get any feedback from them. So as a result of that, the only feedback I really had was myself and my own inner critic. Um, so like many educators, I was used to putting myself last. I was young. I didn't have a partner. I didn't have kids. Um, so I really started, felt like I needed to prove myself. I needed to prove myself in this role. I'm taking over this job. Um, and I just continued to work harder. Um, and because we didn't have support staff, anything that needed to get done, I did. And many of you are, probably can relate to this, especially right now. Um, but I filled in to teach classes. I ended up taking on quite a heavy teaching load. I served as an instructional coach. I served as a guidance counselor when that was needed. I handled the maintenance. Um, if I could do it myself, I did. If I had to call someone, I had to do that. Um, I oversaw the accreditation, I oversaw hiring and essentially anything else that came up. Um, and my vacations, I used to do all of the administrative work that I couldn't get done during the regular school day. So I had very little break. Um, and I didn't really mind juggling these roles and responsibilities at first because I actually found that I was capable of doing much more than I'd ever thought possible. Um, but what happened is the more that I did, the more that I found that I was neglecting my own needs. Um, and I started to push those away. Um, and I found that I got really positive feedback because people felt that they could count on me. Um, and I really liked my job. I really liked my students and I felt genuinely blessed, um, to be in this job, but as time, um, went on the impact of all of this started to accumulate. Um, and I became increasingly less successful with managing the day to day. So probably in about my third year on the job, I started to make more careless mistakes. Um, I would double book appointments. I would have this thing where I would write an email. Somebody would come into my office. I would forget to press send, think I had sent an email, hadn't done it. I made careless mistakes when I was ordering tests or supplies. Um, and I also learned that the more I took on, the more people expected of me. And I could take all of this stuff onto my plate, but I couldn't really offload it. Um, and I just kind of trapped myself in this role of being the one who did everything. Um, and the more that I neglected my needs and the more that I took on, um, I realized that I also suddenly didn't have time to deal with those interpersonal issues that come up um, either between staff, between students. Um, and I would start to push some of that stuff away. Um, and by my fourth year, I really didn't feel like myself anymore. Um, and I actually remember that I had, I had to fire someone um, who um, just wasn't working out in the role. And she said something to me, and we're actually still friends to this day, but I remember at the time she, she made a comment to me and she said, you don't sound like you. 
And she was, she was more upset about the conversation that I wasn't being myself than the fact that I was, I had fired her. And that, (laughs) that really stuck with me because I felt like I was really disconnected with my values at that point. Um, and it all kind of came for, for a head to a head for me because I'm, um, not neurotypical. I have ADHD. I have my whole life. It's well controlled, but I thought at this point, you know what, maybe I need some help with managing my workload, um, with some of those executive functioning skills. So I joined a group, um, like a, a support group, um, to work on some skills. And what I found was that it was, it was really helpful to review some of those skills. Um, and I, it helped a lot with just managing the tasks, but I would come into group and I would have written down, you know, here's my schedule. And the the therapist would look at it and be like, this isn't even possible, right? Like it just like going through that process made me realize that I had so much on my plate that it was physically impossible. Um, And the moment that really changed it for me was I'd lost a ton of weight and I had justified it to myself because at that point in time, I live in the Bay area and intermittent fasting was a huge thing. So I just tell people, oh, I'm intermittent fasting, right? It's not that I don't have time to eat lunch. I was really lying to myself. Um, And so I brought up to this therapist, yeah, I find that, you know, it's helpful um, that I'm able, better able to manage all of the work and tasks that I have to do and keep track of them with the system you've given me, but I'm still dealing with these physical symptoms. And I mentioned to her the weight loss. She said something to me that I'll never forget. She said, she looked at me and she said, no amount of therapy is going to help you to overcome the physical limits of your body. And you're at your limit and you're going to physically collapse if you keep going. And so this was 2019. We were just about to start a new academic year. And I just knew that I couldn't do it anymore. Um, It wasn't working for me. So I ended up giving notice in August And when I gave notice, I felt such a relief because I thought there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I can just get through this one final year. Well, everybody knows what happened in the spring of that year, right? Spring 2020. But the other thing is I had let the situation get so bad that it was such a struggle to get through that last year. Um, When we closed down in spring of 2020, what I felt was relief physically because at least when I was at home, I was better able to do some of those self-care things. And ironically that helped me get to the end of the year, but I had let it get to such a point that I was really at my limit. And I think, you know, that's the thing about burnout is it does creep up on you. You think you're managing and then suddenly you're not. Um, So this um, burnout in occupation is something that's been studied by researchers since the 1970s. So we see Herbert Freudenberger um, has these 12 stages of burnout. Another name you might be familiar with is Christina Maslach. Um, She came up with the Maslach burnout inventory to measure this. But what they found is that burnout is really common in certain professions, specifically in social service jobs, um, in education, medical professionals, social workers, public safety officers. Um, And what happens is in these jobs that tend to um, have very idealistic people, people who wanna help come into them. um, And as time goes on, just the conditions of their work cause them to become disillusioned. They can't have the impact they want. And they begin to lose their sense of energy, their sense of purpose. Um, And this also corresponds with changes that are happening in these professions from the late 1970s into the 1980s. Um, Education is becoming, there are funding changes in education. There are changes in how people are thinking about um, these types of professions. And this is all contributing to the um, phenomenon of burnout in particularly these professions. So the early research around burnout is focused on social service, on education, on healthcare workers. And I think we can really see that many of you who put in the chat, like you can see it in yourself, but you're also witnessing it in the people that you're with every day, right? I think we're really in tune with those people who are in our school, our teachers, our support staff, um, even our students. 
right? So you that even the, in our moment here where we're talking about burnout, you're able to take in and have this um, observer role of like, wow, there are other people that I, I care about and rely on that are also experiencing some of these stages. Yeah. Does that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. It does. Um, so in 2019, the World Health Organization actually came out in their 11th revision of the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, and they um, included um, burnout as an occupational phenomenon in this international um, classification. And so they characterize it by the following things, by feelings of energy depletion and exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job and reduced professional efficacy. And we can think of these characteristics in three dimensions in terms of their impact on our physical, mental, and professional well-being. So just take a moment and read um, through these impacts on the slide and see if any of them relate to you. Have you noticed these in yourself? Maybe you've noticed these signs in your staff, right? And as you're reading these, think about as well, how does this impact you? How does it impact you professionally? How does it impact you personally? And if you notice this in your staff or people in your school, how does it impact them? Yeah, when I look at this, um, the change in sleep habits always really jumps out, right? I started losing a lot of sleep, stress sleeping, right? Intense dreams, not waking up feeling refreshed, which means I drank a lot more coffee or ate a lot more sugar or whatever it was to get through the day, which then didn't make me feel great. It's amazing how we can convince ourselves um, that it's just temporary or it's not a big deal. Yeah. I also found that for me, those physical symptoms also had kind of a negative feedback loop with the mental symptoms and the professional symptoms. So if I wasn't feeling well physically, I would be even more irritable, <laughs> right? I would have even less patience. Um, and I also would feel like I can't even control my body. So how can I have any control over what's happening, you know, in my school, right? So it also impacted my feeling of, you know, my professional competence. All right, so we know that there's these phases of burnout and we know that it's manifesting physically, emotionally, professionally, mentally, all of these things, but what's causing it? Like what's, what's behind this piece? I think, you know, we clearly have consensus that there is burnout. You guys are here, you identify with it in some way, but why do some people become burnt out and others don't? Or why does it seem to impact other people or just where does it come from? So, what, what it really turns out is that it comes down to factors in our work environment. So take a moment and read the slide here. Um, this is by Christina Maslach and Peter Leiter based on surveys of over 10,000 people across a wide range of organizations in several countries. So this is not a uniquely like American phenomenon. Um, schools, we know, because uh, we're a global organization, we know that schools in the many countries that we serve are experiencing burnout. We know that um, also as a global organization, leaders across the board, right, are, are experiencing this in all sectors. So when you're looking at work at workload, control, right, this reward piece, you might also be thinking of some of the other leaders that are in there around, you know, Daniel Pink comes to mind of the autonomy mastery purpose, like, all of these great th thinkers are coming up here because how we feel, right? The sense of agency at, at work can certainly lead to our burnout. So maybe you've jotted down something in your notes. If you wanna pop it into chat, um, if you're Zoom savvy and you have the annotation tool and wanna like put an exclamation point or a check on this slide or anything that you see here, that's factors that are leading to burnout, either that you agree with, you resonate with, right? Too much work, absolutely. And I also invite you in this moment 
as you're thinking about this to just pause and take a big, deep breath. Because <sighs> we've just talked about all the ways that things aren't working for us. Right, we're asking you to step into that space of all of the physical, mental, and emotional factors that are, are having you experience some element of, those, of that burnout cycle. And it's not a linear cycle. It's not like you start at step one and you head all the way through, right? Like you may say, oh, no, I'm experiencing six of those. It doesn't matter. Six is a lot. It's half of them. Yeah. I see someone brought up the impact of burnout on school culture. And I, and I think that's a really important point. I was doing a, a virtual visit at a school and having the meeting with students. And usually in these student meetings, you know, they talk about we have too much homework or, you know, we want a college counselor. But what I was hearing from the students was really shocking. They were saying, my teacher seems stressed out. Like that was their concern. And so the students get it. The students see it as well. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind that even if we think we're doing a good job of hiding it, people are picking up on it. So part of what we're leading you here too is that burnout happens in professions where there's this mismatch between values and ideals or job conditions and personal needs. There's something that's no longer clicking. Some of it's in your control and some of it's not. And one of the things that often happens in environments as we start to like think we're going to solve the problem right and so in this like what are some ways think of some ways like how have you started to address this either you personally in your school or um like you've seen way seen some people start to say oh this is how you address burnout have you gotten advice recommendations around that? Oops. You can pop them into chat. <laughs> like I remember talking with one school leader, actually it was, a, it was a teacher first and then the school leader, that they were going to bring in um, a yoga instructor on Wednesdays and it was one of those like sounds great but what we heard from the teachers was they were like we don't have time to do yoga like that sounds great but but we don't have time to do that right and um I saw Alyssa put in their self-care like there's this broad bucket of like self-care right so how does that help so We've seen some other people. So um, building a wellness platform, right? So is it exactly, right? I'm feeling guilty just for being here right now. Absolutely. It's amazing how we've, what our self-talk is doing for us. We've also seen situations where it's like, I'll bring in pizza. I'll buy everybody lunch. I'll give you a meeting off, right? Like we'll just cancel the faculty meeting. Um, you know, these are things that we're sort of in the moment. We're trying to figure out like, you feel it, you feel it in your organization and you say, I wanna do something, what can I do, right? Chocolate chip cookies solves everything, right? The, the coffee that you pick up on your way because those are things that like in the moment start to feel good but they're really these false solutions. Right? Yeah. And that, and that's not to say that self-care isn't important. And these are all great ways to deal with some of the symptoms of burnout. But I think the important thing is, um, and this is what Maslach's research shows as well. I think Chris, you, you brought this up in the chat. Um, it's not going to solve the underlying problem because burnout isn't an individual problem. It's a problem that stems from this mismatch between an individual's physical, emotional, and professional needs and their work environment. So these are all great, you know, to help build um, camaraderie, to help improve the culture. But it's just like, you know, taking Tylenol if you have a fever. It might help in the moment, 
but the underlying disease, the underlying issue is still there. So the first step in addressing burnout um, is to identify these areas of mismatch in the six factors, right? So looking at workload, looking at the control that we have in our jobs, rewards that we get, the community, conflict, fairness, values, but the solution can't simply focus on the individual. So um, as I mentioned, the solution can't focus on the individual because reversing burnout is going to require us to focus on both the individual and the work factors. So self-care is great. That's one piece of it. What are the other factors we need to look at? And we can think of this in terms of our actions, behaviors, and attitudes. So that's the me, our relationships and our interactions. That's the us and our job duties and responsibilities. And that's the it. So take a moment and think about what do you normally do when you first come into work? If you want to just pop in the chat, what is one of the first things maybe that you do? Yeah. So I was just going to write the same thing that Brenton wrote, check email. Yeah, schedule day and emails. This is usually the first thing that people do. <laughs> yes, I agree, Elizabeth. I also work from home and that's the first thing I do. I always start my day with checking my email. Yeah, as you see, sometimes it's even before the workday's technically started. Mm. <laughs> So what usually tends to happen is that we notice that what we do tends to focus on that it piece, on the tasks that we have to get done. So check emails, we make our schedule, maybe we go into a meeting. The lowest tends to be checking in with ourselves on how we're doing. Um, and also checking in maybe with our team. So some of you maybe do that, but we find that the it tends to take center stage. So take a moment and just think about what is the impact of that? What is the impact of just focusing on the tasks? So I'll just share um, the, the impact for me, um, especially when I was a principal of checking emails first um, is that it would often start me out in a bad mood for the day because I'd sit down and I'd have an email that a parent had written, you know, that night, the previous night, upset about something. And that's the first thing that I'm seeing coming into my day. And it just put me in a negative headspace. Yeah. It would start me off already starting the day feeling overwhelmed. Yeah, thanks, Alyssa. I agree. You start off your day, but you're lacking that true connection, yeah. right? I think I certainly know when I got into schools, none of it was to do paperwork and um, check emails and put out fires, right? It was that connection and that heart of service, wanting to see the kids. And yet there was this looming feeling that if I didn't check my email, I was going to miss something super critical that first thing in the morning. Right. Um, and so I had to be, you know, you have to be careful about, yes, that's true. And... <laughs> Also, how do I stay connected and in community that I had, that I loved, right? That's why I was there. Yeah. So one of the impacts of having the it circle big and the me circle small is stress. And if that stress becomes chronic, it can lead to burnout. So recognizing our own needs, the me, um, and bringing these circles back into balance is the key to reducing stress and burnout. Um, and being emotionally in touch is one way we have of breaking the circuit by becoming more self-aware and addressing the real needs that are there rather than trying to do more outside ourselves and to work harder. But it's not your responsibility to make the me bubble bigger. Um, the it and the us need to shrink as well. Um, and burnout again, just to reiterate, it's not an individual problem. So the solutions must address those underlying factors of burnout um, and our emotions can help key us into 
what are those needs? Um, what are what are those factors that are really um, keeping us from balance in our lives? And so like as part of this service industry, right? Or maybe it's something we've conditioned for a long time. We tend to you know, put our needs last. And I certainly know when I was first being coached and mentored into leadership, there was a lot of like, you know, do whatever you part of your leadership is to do whatever is needed, which is great. But it also meant that I came at the bottom of the to-do list. Mm -hmm. So this idea of connecting to emotions in these next couple of slides, you're going to have seen a lot. And chances are you're working on SEL in your school. You've been talking about emotions, right? This component isn't new, but sometimes it's nice to reconnect with this idea of what what are, what are we feeling? Are we in touch with what's going on? Can we actually name the, the emotion that's happening? Or are we um, moving into some element of even toxic positivity? And I don't know if this has shown up in any of your schools or in your world, but we're just like, you know, I think someone put in the chat, like, I'm just trying to make it till Friday and I'm living for vacations. And as a leader, like I'm going to show no weakness and I'm going to stay positive and I'm going to be super upbeat and I'm always going to be smiling and put on my brave face and stay in gratitude. And again, all of those are important, right? A robust gratitude practice is really, really impactful. And of course you want to smile. And yes, you are the ultimate cheerleader. And we're not saying those things aren't important and that leaders don't need to set the tone. But what we learned, so, and we can share this article with you, is in 2002, um, we took data from thousands of leaders across schools and industries. And we learned that leaders who embraced the messiness of the situation, right, the, the chaos, the uncertainty, the unknowingness of what was happening, that they, and when they shared in that vulnerability, when they asked for help, when they held space for emotional processing, rather than just like, it's okay, we're gonna get through this. We're not only more successful in leading their organizations, but we're also way more successful in taking care of themselves, their own personal resilience. And new leadership mindsets were emerging. Things like, it's okay to be human or change is something I'm just gonna learn from. And I trust myself to see what was needed. When at a time we were having to abandon, you know, procedures. There was no procedure for shutting down a school for a pandemic, like it certainly wasn't in any of my manuals. So we had to, had to have these new leadership mindsets emerge. And um, we'll drop that link to the article if you wanna read more about it and the research behind this messy leadership. But the consequence of the, the sort of like false toxic positivity or not necessarily holding the space, sort of doubling down on the hero, the leader is superhero dilemma that we get sometimes locked into is what happens when we don't actually deal with our emotions? Like what are some of the consequences? And we, we're seeing those in the burnout, right? We've got lack of emotional regulation. We've got behavioral problems. We see this in our students. We start to have poor coping mechanisms, right? All of a sudden you're snapping at the person in the checkout line because they're not going fast enough because you barely had enough time to get into the market in order to get the things for dinner because you just ran out of time. And you're starting to really disconnect from the head and heart within your whole body, right? So this piece, right, we talk about emotions but let's take a minute here and really reconnect with why emotions are important to you. Why do we need to feel them and see them and acknowledge them? So we may, you may, you know, the name it to tame it from Dan Siegel, right? Like we start to talk about emotions and all of a sudden, it loses some of its power over us, right? We start to recognize it in our body. You're like, oh, that flutter in my stomach, my elevated heart rate. I don't know if any of you were wearing um, like wearables at that time, but my heart rate, I know certainly went up 
throughout the course of the last couple of years. And then what this gets into, I'm sure you've seen this, if we want to go to the next slide, Victoria, around, mm -hmm. um, you know, our scale of emotions. I know that this is a very well-known um, image, right? That there are the different basic emotions and that they have different levels of intensity. But if you haven't really thought about emotions in a long time and you haven't spend any time practicing naming what's going on in your own world, it's worth revisiting the scale of emotions piece and seeing where you end up on a wheel like this or one of the many other visual tools that are out there. And I think the big key here is that emotions tell us something. So at this point, right, take a minute and I want you to step back into a recent event that brought up some strong emotions. It can be at work. If you can own have one at work or one that you don't wanna step back into at work, it can be at home. Like put yourself back in there, close your eyes if you're comfortable and really think about what's happened. What sensations, can you name the emotions? How does it feel in your body? Can you take that pause? What are you saying to yourself? What's coming up for you? And if you had any ahas, take a moment and jot them down. Okay. Back to you, Victoria. Yeah, so as you're, you're jotting down some of your thoughts, um, just to reiterate, our emotions are just a response that motivates us to action. Um, so you can see on the screen here, we have these seven basic emotions um, and all of these emotions are trying to tell us something. They're trying to tell us something about an unmet need. So when we feel anger, for example, um, usually it's telling us that a boundary has been crossed or a need has been un unmet. So in order to address that, we need to either set a boundary, right? Or we need to figure out what is that need. Fear is another one. We usually fe we feel fear when there's danger or when we perceive that there's danger. So it's telling us that we need to either fight, flight, or freeze. And our need is that we need to feel safe. So behind all of these basic emotions, lies a need for us that's not being met. Um, and somebody had mentioned in the chat that, you know, one of the issues in the workplace is actually relegating emotions to the background. And when we do that, what happens is we're not just ignoring our emotions, but we're ignoring our needs. And we might be able to get away with it for a little while, but as we know with burnout, there are phases and the more we ignore those needs, the more things compound and it becomes a feedback loop, right? If we're not addressing the physical and the mental, that's going to impact us professionally, right? And that's only going to make us feel worse mentally and maybe physically, and it feeds on itself. So emotions are important because they're telling us about an unmet need. Okay. So I'm just going to jump to um, this slide. So once we've identified the emotion um, and we're aware of what they're telling us, the next step is that we need to decide how to respond. Now, one of the tricky things about emotions is that when we're feeling strong emotions, we also tend to have this really negative, exaggerated self-talk that we're telling ourselves. So um, for example, and we may also notice physical sensations. So we may get sweaty palms, we may get an upset stomach, racing heart, um, but it's that negative self-talk that's keeping those emotions alive. Um, so as you can see on the screen here, um, there are usually two things that happen with these negative, with this negative self-talk. There is the judge part of us that's going to make broad and sweeping judgments about the situation or about the people involved. You know, I'm terrible at this. You know, these people are never going to learn. Um, then we have the pessimists that's immediately going to focus on 
the downsides in any given situation, right? So nothing I do is going to make a difference here. You're focused in on all of those negatives, um, or you immediately focus in on the problems with individuals. But the key is to focus on that realist, to kind of get through to from that negative self-talk to think about what is really true here. Um, because when we're burned out, we tend not to think realistically. Our self-talk tends to be either the judge or the pessimist. And especially if one of the factors leading to our burnout is a lack of feedback. Because if you remember from my story, when you're not receiving feedback, you tend to give feedback to yourself. You have this internal critic. So that's going to be your judge or it's going to be your pessimist. So all of the feedback you're getting from yourself is going to be negative. Yeah, absolutely. Mine was always, I'm doing so much, right? And why isn't it enough? Yeah. So uh, we have a great tool. It's easy to use. You can use it on yourself. You can use it with others. And it's called um, ETC. And the short version, you know, you can really think about it as heart, head, and then hands. Because one of the things that happens when we're in our pessimist judge is we're all up here in our head and we're listening to this self-talk and it's all head-based. And so first we need to connect down into our emotions and we need to sort of see what's going on. What am I feeling? We need to acknowledge it. That's why we re brought you back to that feelings part. What am I feeling? What is my self-talk? What is, what is coming up here? What are the emotions telling me? And, and spending a moment with yourself in your body and just being really like clear on that. There's no judgment here. And this is where you just need to get it out, right? I'm a big fan of writing this down or talking through, but like getting it out. What, why did the email bug you, right? What was the ding, whatever it was. The next part of it then is looking at that truth piece. So taking a deep breath, right? Working on our... Um, nervous system, then what is the truth in this moment, right? So the ding of the email, the parent is upset. Like in that moment, do I have to respond to that email? Like what's really true? And analyzing some of that self-talk, am I a horrible person? Are they never gonna listen? You know, I knew this would happen. All those exaggerated pieces, like what's really true about, no, I'm not a horrible person. Yes, we'll figure this out everything's going to be okay. Right. And really grounding yourself in those moments of truth. And then you can take another deep breath and then you move into your empowerment place, which is your choice. And this is what helps you feel unstuck in that agency piece. What choices do I have and what do I actually want to make? And you just start listing them out, right? I can, like thinking about the email. <laughs> I could not respond. I could respond immediately. I can wait the 24 hours that I've given myself. I can write something and have someone else read it. I can call that parent. Like you start to just list out all of these different options. And you're like, oh, the one that I want to take emerges. Now, sometimes the choice that you need or want to make may trigger another emotion, which means you go back through this process, right? So let's say it's holding a boundary that you're not going to answer emails at midnight or whenever this one came in. And that triggers guilt or you start feeling stressed because this parent's going to want a response from you. And now, you know, then work back through the process, right? Because now I have anxiety over not responding to that email after hours. So what's true in that moment and what choices do I have? So this cycle, while simple, is incredibly powerful, especially when you can be really honest with yourself. So there's a series of questions that you can always ask. So this is a more broken down version of, that, of the process. Um, so you can think about that time that we had you reflect on where some strong emotions came up in your work. And we can then walk through this ETC process. And we have a few minutes here. So um, we're gonna pop you into breakout rooms and you can talk about what's come up for you. You can work through this on your, own. If you want to share with somebody in your breakout room, you guys can talk about this. It's really the next probably, I don't know, three minutes or so. 
are really just for you to start putting some of these in play. And I'll tell you the ETC process needs more than three minutes on a, on a regular day, but just to give you a, a small chance to start to practice because you can actually do it relatively quickly once you tap into the power of it. I am just going through and assigning breakout rooms. Or, you know, um, Victoria, I'm noticing that a bunch of people have next meetings. I wonder if we just pause here for a minute and they can just do a self reflection. Mm. Maybe as because I've noticed a few people dropping off saying that they have a few, that they have another yeah. meeting at the top of the hour. So maybe why don't we do this? Why don't um, I can guide them through the process and they can kind of do that reflection. Yeah, that would be great. Themselves. Okay. Let's do it that way. All right. So. Let's just take a moment. Um, if you'd like to close your eyes, if you'd like to turn your camera off. And I want you to connect to a moment um, of a trigger. So a recent experience at work where you felt sort of strong emotions. So focus in on that moment. How are you feeling? Think about the emotions that come up. What's your body language? How are you showing up physically? Do you have any physiological symptoms that you're noticing as you're in this moment? And then what are you saying to yourself? What is the self-talk? What is your pessimist saying? What is your judge saying? And as you're focusing in on the self-talk, what does that mean about you? What does that say about you, the self-talk? Okay, now take a deep breath or two and let it go, just relax. So now I want you to connect to a moment when you were at your best. Think back to a moment when you were feeling really good, really feeling like you were at your best. And I want you to try to get into that mindset as we explore the truths in this moment. So what is true about this moment? Think about some of the things that you are saying to yourself, some of those negative statements. Focus on them one at a time. And I want you to answer, what is the truth about that statement now? Is this statement really true? So think back to that self-talk. Now take another deep breath or two, and then let it go and relax. What choices come to you now? Think about what are the options that you have what can you do differently in this situation? Or what could you do differently if the situation were, were to occur again? And then is there an action that you commit to? What are those emotions telling you that you need to do? Finally, what have you learned about yourself, about the situation? Take another deep breath maybe two, just let go and relax. So if you wanna open your eyes, come back. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna stop the recording, Tara. Um, if you want to debrief, with them about how that was for them, maybe something that they commit to. All right. All right, well, welcome back from the ETC process. I hope you found that um, experience to be really enlightening and can see how powerful this tool can be. So we wanna to close today's workshop by really reiterating that burnout isn't an individual problem. And while there are steps that you can do to work on how you're feeling, there is no shame or you shouldn't feel that this is your sole burden to solve. Unfortunately, that can lead to people hiding their burnout until it becomes such a serious issue 
that it does impact their health or their careers and it can take years to recover from. And that's why it's really important to recognize these early signs of burnout and start to address the underlying factors that are so key so that you can make choices. Now that you have wrapped things up, um, I would love for you to take a minute and think about a takeaway that you have gotten from our time together and a commitment that you're interested in making to address your own burnout. What is it that you can do start putting into action right away. All right. So one final thing we want to leave you with is a question or a curiosity as to why Victoria and I are here and why we're talking about burnout and why BTS Spark is so interested in this topic. Well, we are really invested in developing educational leaders, and we know from our research that there are 33 mindsets that are part of the massive foundation for leadership. And what we shared with you today are subsets of two of our leadership hexagons, personal resilience and emotional awareness. So if you're interested in learning more, we regularly host workshops like this, as well as connect people one-on-one with professional coaches. So we're a not-for-profit division of an award-winning global leadership company. We encourage you to reach out to us for no obligation discovery call to find out about coaching and how we may be able to support you or your team during this school year. And if you're with an organization, your school or district may have funds that you can use towards coaching because this work falls under educator wellness and there um, are COVID relief funds for some organizations, for some districts that are earmarked for this type of work. And many districts are also bringing in groups of people together so they can have a collaborative experience because one of the things that we do know is that it can feel very isolating and very lonely to be a school leader today. All right, so one other reason that people select BTS Spark is because we certainly know that right now as a school leader, as a district leader, as a classroom leader, people really don't have the extra time or capacity to be doing this kind of coaching or work on their on their own. And it's so valuable and it requires you to be incredibly vulnerable. So if you're trying to do coaching or you think, oh, I should talk to a mentor or, you know, I'll just talk to my supervisor. Sometimes that power dynamic prevents you from being really um, as honest or as real as you want to be, which is really necessary in order to make shifts. So we'll send out an email with a replay. You'll have contact info if you'd like to schedule that conversation. And if you're interested in any of the upcoming workshops, webinars, or um, learning opportunities that we have, please follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, We also have lots of our past webinars up on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to sign up for our second part of this series, Addressing Burnout and Others, on February 9th.